048 Grand River Avenue at Wyoming in Detroit, Michigan. COVID-19 drive through testing and winter apparel giveaway. Every fourth Saturday, starting February 27th at Greater Grace Temple, 23500 West 7 Mile Road in Detroit, Michigan. Know your status. Free HIV test also available at the Debo Sheffield Center. For more information about this, call 313-491-0003. Partnering sponsors are Greater St. Mark Baptist Church, Third New Hope Baptist Church, the Detroit Association of Black Organizations, and New Destiny Baptist Church. Know your status. Free HIV test also available at the Debo Sheffield Center. For more information about this, call 313-491-0003. Have you been denied credit or hit with high interest rates? A low credit score happens to many of us, and millions of people are victims of incorrect items on their credit reports and don't even know it. That's why you need credit repair now. Our proven process has resulted in past clients seeing on average 11 negative items removed from their credit report and a 40-point increase after the first four months in our program. Call now and request your credit report and credit score for free in minutes. Call 1-800-783-9197. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. My name is Robert Fatano, and uh, we're going to have you for the next two hours here from 8 to 10. And uh, we're going to, as uh, usual, with our usual panel, we're going to have uh, Scotty Bowman, we're going to have Tom Chowski, and we're going to have Police Commissioner Willie Burton as well. And, um, you know, uh, 1922 was a special year, and I'm just going to start it off a little bit with this on 9:10 a.m. And uh, there's, there's some interesting uh, facts that uh, about 9:10 a.m., when it first started in uh, 1922, that uh, what was life like back then? Just a few things. Number one, there was no WXYZ. There was no Channel 7 at the time. There was no WDIV. Uh, and uh, WJBK, these are our three main TV stations, where it was just the AM radio. So, uh, and also there was no um, FM radio when 910 went on the air. Uh, when it did in 1922, it was the early 20s. And we soon know what followed in the 1930s, and then with um, FDR being elected and, and, and that type of situation. But we'll go through some of these fun facts as we uh, talk about a little bit of the history of uh, 910 and starting in 1922 as well. But uh, we'll sprinkle those uh, throughout the show just a little bit. As I said, we have our usual panel. There was a lot of. Uh, Activity that happened, uh, some of it centered on Michigan this uh, past week. Uh, we'll start a little bit off with Tom Chosky here. Uh, President Biden visited uh, the state of Michigan. He went to the Pfizer plant to, about the vaccinations and the rollout. But with the weather and things, there seems to be some complications with the rollout of the vaccine. And uh, he did run very uh, strongly on that he was going to make sure that all the Americans were going to get the vaccines that wanted the vaccine. And some of that seems uh, like, like anything else. It's a little bit difficult initially to, to get your feet planted squarely and then uh, start running at 100 miles an hour. But with this pandemic, uh, a lot of people have expectations that uh, there's going to be a rollout and people are going to be able to get the shot. So. Tom, how do you think the uh, president fared on some of that this week, especially visiting, uh, Wash uh, visiting Michigan, I should say, from Washington? Well, well Bob, uh, you know, good morning, and it's, uh, it's, it's hard to say. So we have to see how big of an impact these storms really have on vaccination. Uh, so far, since the end of the Trump administration, we've seen roughly about a 50 to 60 percent increase in the amount of vaccinations that were given. The very end of the Trump administration, it was about a million-ish per day uh, were being administered, and now we're seeing that number being about 1.5, 1.75, somewhere in that range. Um, so we've seen a really big uh, leap in the last 30 days. Now, to get us to the level that uh, President Biden wants us to be, we need to be at about 4 million a day. And, you know, the trip to the Pfizer plant is, is definitely good because it helps not only highlight, Bob, like you said, 
Michigan on the national stage and how we are a leader in this coronavirus fight. It also goes to, it, it also is really contingent on not, I'm saying that there's more than Pfizer and Moderna out there. Pfizer and Moderna are the two currently approved uh, vaccines, but we're also hopefully going to get approval of a Johnson & Johnson vaccine as well. And when you get that supply into the market, plus the increases of what those those workers were working on when President Biden came by at Pfizer and what the workers are doing on the farm uh, now, that's when you can finally get enough that delivery to start to get to that 4 million uh, doses per day. And now projections are that we might be able to see most people vaccinated by sometime this summer. So there's a lot of hope. Um, you know, we'll see what, what happens with this storm. And Bob, as you mentioned, on vaccinations in some, some areas that were hard hit. But overall, uh, honestly, there's a lot of things to be uh, positive and excited about. Uh, one of the announcements he had, Tom, or Scotty can jump in or Willie, is that uh, he was going to get uh, the president was going to uh, allow four billion dollars in worldwide distribution of uh, vaccines as well. I think sometimes that gets misunderstood. People say, "Well, if you got four billion dollars, you're going to ship out the vaccines." Uh, you know, why aren't we doing it in the United, uh, solely in the United States at this point? And for the pandemic to really be under control like in return to normal, like we want with the rest of the world, uh, you need really, a, when they talk about herd immunity, you need to have the rest of the world be able to conquer this pandemic as well. If you only have it in the United States, you're not really going to eliminate it and it will keep creeping back into the system. I think people sometimes misunderstand, but uh, it's important that the, the vaccines uh, be distributed throughout the world as well. Obviously, the priority is the United States. It has to be. Because, number one, you know, it was developed in this country, and usually that's going to be the priority of where you're going to distribute it. But you need that immunity to start spreading out throughout the rest of the world. If you don't have it, uh, then the economy, uh, everybody's worried about the economy, that, that definitely slows it down because you can't interact with a lot of other part of the world. If, if Europe is closed down, if Africa is closed down, it's going to have a dramatic impact on the uh, on uh, the world's uh, stage for uh, for the economy as well. Well, I think, yeah, I think yeah. foreign aid is actually um, being more of a taking money from poor people in the United States, or in general, it's taking money from poor people in rich countries and then giving it to the rich people in the poor countries. Um, I'm not quite sure that we should have it that way. I, I would think more that um, we should make it available to anyone in the world who wants the vaccine. But um, as far as who's paying for it, if Americans are already being taxed to pay for something, then it should go to the Americans. It shouldn't go to other people that aren't being taxed to, to um, receive it. And um, that, that should be a separate matter as to whether or not other countries or other people um, want to buy it. Or if Americans really feel strongly that, hey, we want to get this vaccine out to the people in surrounding countries because it's going to improve our overall safety and it's the right thing to do, then they should be able to donate money to that purpose, just like any other way of donating money for a foreign cause. Well, you see one of the complications of it, though, is I think Canada, from what I understand, has been stepped in, in some of the process of, of trying to get to their own citizens. So they're out trying to buy it. And uh, you saw that the border's been closed, again, another month between Canada and the in the United States. So how do you start to open the, and, and Canada is a big, uh, actually our largest trading partner of the United States. And so there's a limitation of what, they, they, there's some trade that goes back and forth between our two borders, but uh, really have the open uh, border to be able to uh, interact uh, with uh, Canada and it's right on our border. Uh, it, it's, it, it seems like you have to be able to help them somehow to get that vaccine. But they missed step, and it looks like there's a manufacturing plant. They're still waiting for it to be made, or I should say built, and then, uh, and then the vaccine can be made. It, you know, it seems like it's a, it's a mess up there. And at the same time, um, you know, it's completely closed the border to the United States uh, at, at this point, except for some uh, commercial transactions and things like that. So it's, it's not an easy situation to try to work out because the rest of the world has to be immune at the same time that 
we're doing it here in the United States. And we see it's being used as a as um, uh, part of the international uh, pressure points. Uh, China is uh, trying to get out its vaccines to parts of the world, um, and that follows Congress. I mean, if if, if China uh, and Russia are able to say, look, we've given you vaccines, so we want you to just uh, simply trade with us if you're going to help us uh, uh, hack into the United States and some of its uh, um, abilities for uh, technology and things like that. Uh, it, it builds world alliances. And if, if Biden's going to pressure China and some of the other ones, I think the vaccine becomes part of that whole process that we got to make sure that uh, um, we're part of on, on the world stage. At the same time, you're absolutely right. Priority has to be the United States in, in the way they set it up. I know it's sort of like this uh, circular motion of which one goes, you know, is able to administer this uh, fastest. But uh, I think it's important that we're on the world stage and working with some of the other countries um, because the United States has always been a leader in what we've been able to do with some of that. And uh, we've sort of taken steps back during the Trump administration, and now we can use it to, to make sure that our commerce, our businesses are protected. Um, and at the same time, uh, like you said, it has to be a priority for the vaccines to be in the United States at the same time. So it's it's not as easy or simple as it sounds sometimes in the way that it's set up. Well, and, and uh, just to, to build on that, you know, Scotty did bring up a great point, and Bob, you said it too, exactly. Um, the American people have to be the number one priority, and the Biden administration has made the American people the number one priority. Four billion dollars, that's a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of the COVID relief package, that's a rounding error of a rounding error. So it's like saying, hey, yeah, we're, we're going to go and put, you know, we got $100 in our wallet. We're going to give $99.95 to the American people, and then we're going to have $0.05 cents that we're going to take out of our pocket and give to this person in need. So at the end of the day, it's not going to be something that really, uh, you know, puts the American people out. It's going to be just about, like you said, help build America's interests around the world. There's been some activity here in Michigan that uh, I think has been uh, interesting. Let's say that uh, the governor yesterday issued another executive order limiting or, I guess, helping the propane industry in terms of releasing some of the limits on it for transportation and, and things like that. And people are con- are concerned about propane because it's used uh, intensely for uh, heat. We're in the middle of... Uh, the winter here, where uh, the winter is gripping not only us here in Michigan, but we see the results of some of that in Texas uh, that is uh, that has occurred. And some people, uh, the critics are are coming out and saying that, well, the governor wants to free the propane and uh, you know declaring an emergency. That's what she's doing. And yet, there's line five that is the main uh, one of the main lines for propane. Uh, between the Upper Peninsula and, and uh, obviously, uh, the Lower Peninsula, why is she against line five and yet declaring an emergency uh, for propane? Do you think it's a, you think it's a contradiction, or do you think it's a bad luck? Well, uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, uh, make sure people understand, line five doesn't actually serve Michigan. It transports through Michigan. So the majority of what goes through line five goes from one processing plant in Canada to another processing plant in Canada. Certainly the United States and Michigan, we're just the travel conduit for that natural gas. That then gets refined, and then it gets loaded up onto trucks, and that's how it gets to, uh, you know, our households and to, you know, our, our grills and everything like that. So what the governor is doing is she's just trying to make sure that we're, we're being proactive and we're ensuring that Michiganders are taken care of ahead of any potential increases in the price of propane and any potential shortages that might be started because of demand otherwhere, not, you know, because of line five. I think the gas up in general, which is not just propane, but I'm seeing a surge in gas prices um, for the past couple months. Yeah, you're right, uh, Scotty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's gone from about two dollars a gallon. I, I now, depending on where you are, I mean, uh, Costco and some of the other ones are two, two, 
240, but now we're seeing as high as uh, 260. I've seen something uh, now on the road as high as $3 a gallon uh, when, uh, when I've been driving. So, uh, yeah, there, there does seem to be this surge in gasoline prices. I know the Middle East, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, is uh, going to increase the number of uh, barrels because they feel that the price of uh, uh, the fuel is going up, and it's part of it. That uh, do you think people are going to link this to uh, President Biden? I have. So I'm, I'm sorry. What? I just don't think it's a coincidence. Um, you know, there was that pipeline that closed down. You know, where 10,000 people or so lost their jobs at the same time, but and also cutting down on supply. I think people are reacting to it, and all uh, the climate alarmism. Hmm. Okay, we have a caller here, Jerry. Jerry, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Robert Vicano. Good morning to you, sir. How are you today? Good. How about you? Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking my call, and good morning to your distinguished guest. Uh, Mr. Robert Zicano, uh, thank God vaccine is here, and everybody will get his vaccine, and thanks to our President uh, Joe Biden visiting this, the great state of Michigan uh, to check uh, the uh, factories, and uh, that was a beautiful uh, support from the president to the citizens. So God bless him, and God bless the vice president. Mr. Robert Zicano, my question to you and to the guest, every now and on, I hear from a few individuals who they criticize the vice president, uh, Madam Kamala Harris, like they say she is not enough black or not black enough. And that kind of bothers me. And if this is not a racist, what the racist will be? So I would love to hear an answer from your guest and from you. Don't you think shame on some people on, on Superstition 910, people like that to be called? Uh, sometimes I, with my respect to the host, uh, I, the, the host should uh, be very firm and to tell the people this is not right. I mean, uh, we understand Kamala Harris, uh, her background, she's from a mother from India and a father from Jamaica. That doesn't make her any uh, different than anybody else, white or black or brown. She's a vice president, and she was chosen by elected president of the United States, uh, uh, Mr. Biden. So I would love to hear the answer uh, from your guest. Thank you, and God bless you. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't think it uh, makes any sense to uh, criticize her and say she doesn't have enough blackness uh, within her at this point. She's, uh, let's not forget, she was also elected as a prosecutor in California. She's also elected as an attorney general. She was elected as a U.S. senator. I mean, quite the resume and, and ability that she's been able to put together. And I think to, to criticize her, say that she's not uh, uh, black enough, and I, I think she's been very visible on a number of racial issues. I mean, she's become an advocate uh, for uh, uh, you know racial justice and, and issues such as that. So I, I, I think it's a weak criticism of her uh, at this point. Uh, I don't know, Tom or or uh, Willie or something like that want to weigh in. Well, you know, I'll, I'll just say about to build on what you were talking about and, and Jerry, what you called in on, um, you know, at the end of the day, the discussions that we have about uh, our leaders, they need to be focused on what are our leaders doing for us? You know, at the end of the day, we can't make this um, like a celebrity kind of game. We can't get into the TMZ business and talk about the stuff that doesn't matter because that's how we've allowed over the last several hundred years these politicians to ignore the will of the people and to get away with doing whatever they want because we have been distracted by the things that don't matter and we're not focusing on things that really do matter, like, you know, Scotty and Bob were talking about, like energy costs, uh, things that really impact Americans' lives. Well, you know, you know, 
go ahead. We'll, we'll get it after the break here, Scotty. Um, we'll be uh, right back to this in the 910 AM, the Superstation. We'll be back after these uh, few messages. And Ben Cole Thompson. Go read my people. Crusader for Justice by George Damon Key, who died fighting for black people. Did more for black people than Wendell Anthony will ever do in this nation. But well, here's what Damon Key said Wendell Anthony. He's a bully, he's a thug, and he's a two bit hustler who has used the presidency of the Detroit branch of the NAACP for his own financial and political gain. Wendell Anthony is kneeling before the mayor like a puppy, culturally emasculated leader of the NAACP. You ain't no threat to no status quo. We see through you. And you can only get it here on 910 AM Superstation. Are you looking for a great deal on advertising? Here at 910 AM Superstation, we're going to make you an offer that you can't refuse with our Godfather Package Special. You can receive 200 spots for $500. That's right, 200 spots for only $500. That's $2.50 per spot. All spots must stay within a 30-day schedule. And 910 AM Superstation will produce your spots for free. Please contact Renisha Williams at 313-434-8291. That's 313-434-8291. Please call now. This is Central Park Deli today and receive 10% off any purchase when ordering from our mobile app and enter promo code 910AM. Our new menu items include gluten-free wraps, spinach wraps, fried spicy buffalo cauliflower, and sweet potato maple cheesecake. Don't forget about our always delicious Sy Ginsberg corned beef, our fresh hand patty charbroiled 100% premium beef burgers, and our homemade teriyaki stir fries. Central Park Deli has curbside service available and DoorDash delivery. Come visit us today. The All About Women's Health Boutique is the place for a perfect fit for you and all of the ladies in your life. Beginners bras and beyond, whatever your need, we can provide the perfect fit. From sports bras to mastectomy needs, sizes 28AA to 52M, our certified and experienced fitters are at your service. Call the All About Women's Health Boutique today at 248-477-2729 to schedule your appointment for your private fitting. Enjoy the comfort of our beautiful boutique as our certified fitters provide the best of service located at 33104 grand river in downtown farmington all about women's health boutique offers the best bras in the industry so call today to schedule your private fitting with our certified and experienced fitters and breast cancer survivors your bras and prostheses may be covered by your health insurance all about women's health boutique 33104 grand river in farmington 248-477-2729 call for your appointment today Detroit Soul, voted top five best soul food restaurant in Metro Detroit by Vote for the Best 2020. Try our homestyle daily offerings of fried chicken, baked turkey wings, smothered pork chops, meatloaf coupled with made-from-scratch mac and cheese, cornbread dressing, and sweet candied yams with many more of your traditional favorites. Exclusive weekend special features signature outdoor barbecue experience with our succulent cherry smoked barbecue spare ribs and juicy half barbecue chicken, satisfying the most critical barbecue lover. Detroit Soul offers catering services for all business, corporate, public, and home events. Located at 2900 East 8 Mile Road between DeQuinder and Ryan. Closed Monday, open Tuesday through Friday, noon to 8 p.m. Saturday, 11 to 8 p.m. Sunday, 2 to 6 p.m. Visit DetroitSoul.net. The same care placed in the cooking process is also invested into the customer service experience. Gotta get you some. Need a little good news in your life? Well, here's the deal. State Farm has new lower car insurance rates in Michigan, so you can now get the service and convenience of State Farm agent Delapo Shodapo at an even better price. That's right. State Farm can help you save more cash and get the good neighbor service you deserve. State Farm agent Delapo Shodapo is ready to help you save in the metro Detroit area. Call Delapo Shodapo at 734-744-8255. That's State Farm agent Delapo Shodapo at 734-744-8255. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Breaking news. Bogali Leather is extending their sale by popular demand for a limited time. Everything must go. Price is close to wholesale. 25 to 80% off men's leather jackets starting from $80 and ladies from $50. Ladies wool for $25. Men's wool one for $60, two for $100. Ladies mink starting from $500. Men's mink starting from $700. Sheer for $200. Ladies leather pants from $60. Ladies shoes for $10. Men's shoes for $20 while quantities last. No fair offer will be refused. Check out Bogali Leather on 8 Mile and Kelly in East Point. 10, the Superstation, Detroit's only African-American talk radio.
Good, good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. My name is Robert Connell. We're joining the uh, panel, which is uh, Scott Bowman as well as Tarkovsky and Police Special Willie Burton. Uh, we have a couple callers. Before we get to them real quick, Scotty, you wanted to uh, finish up on the, what we were discussing before the break? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think actually someone else was trying to comment right before the break. Who was? Oh, Tom was? Okay. Was it you, Tom? Oh, no, I, I think I was the only one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Miscommunications mis- mis- here. We do have some callers. Mr. Paul, did it? You're on? Hey, good morning, you guys. Hey, good morning. Hey, Caroline, what, what was the discussion about? Well, yeah. we're talking about a lot of the issues about Biden and uh, the vaccines, and uh, some callers have brought, or a caller brought up about uh, uh, Vice President Harris, if she's uh, black enough, um, you know, that has been a criticism, which she thought was a weak criticism of her, which pretty well all of us agree to that. So that was some of the discussion that was going on. What's on your mind? Well, uh, I really haven't been watching it too closely. What Biden's been doing. Do you guys think he's been doing a good job? Um, in I, the sense that is, are we getting uh, the states getting the uh, proper amount of vaccines? And I think yes. Yeah, I think for I think for what the supply was. I mean, you can only do as what is manufactured, and I think that he's trying to push the manufacturing. He bought another. A uh, large amount of doses that are going to be available uh, to be uh, distributed. And I think the weather has uh, hampered a lot of the distribution that has gone on. I'm not. I'm not making excuses one way or another. Uh, I think uh, some of it is, um, you know, uh, a stutter step trying to get them to um, be able to do this, uh, you know, in a smooth way. But uh, it, it, it's the problem is you have distribution to 50 different states. There isn't a, 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 I think, a central federal registry that says, here, here's what we're going to do it, here's where the centers are set up. So, you know, they left it in lots of the discretion, even when you talk about ages and things like that. The CDC has recommended, obviously, that it should be seniors and frontline workers and, and um, uh, health workers and, and things like that. But it's still technically left up to the and how they want to distribute it. So you got 50 di- you really got 50 different plans in the way that it is being distributed at this point. So it makes it, yeah. makes it, uh, makes it complicated. Yes, logistically it's uh, quite um, serpentine. So uh, I, too, uh, to- I totally understand what you're saying, Mr. Robert Fakano. Um, hey, everybody, thanks for taking my call. Uh, stay warm right. and uh, stay yeah, in the magic you of your dreams. Peace to you guys. Okay, before we get to uh, Greg Dunmore, we have uh, Vincent. Vincent, you have some thoughts on this? Good morning, Mr. Fricano, and to your co-host, both of them. Uh, it, uh, the, producing the vaccination was something similar to, um, to the Super Bowl, if you recall. It was originally brought here by uh, Dennis Archer. He put it in place, but by the time it actually came to Detroit, it was um, Kilpatrick was in office. So Kilpatrick uh, reaped the praise. Most people thought he's the one who brought the Super Bowl here. But uh, if you think about it, at the time that uh, Joe Biden became president, we were already doing million-plus vaccinations a day. Without the previous previous administration, uh, there would be no vaccine at this time. If you recall, he put it on warp speed, went to... um, a collegiate uh, a laboratories, private laboratories, to mass produce this thing it was, it, to the speed as possible to be done. And at the time Joe Biden took office, we were already doing a million plus per day. Therefore, when Joe Biden said we'll do a hundred million vaccinations in a hundred days, well, that's a million per day. We were already doing that rate. If you if you really think about it, we were already doing that right before he came into office. So it's not a, but you can only give out as many as can be produced, and that is the case. So my point is, the credit does still lie within the previous administration. Dr. Fauci said after, I think it was in month of December, that we are where we 
on now that normally takes five to six years to get vaccinations, at least to the mass production that had taken place by December. So the, the credit still goes to the previous administration. Now, the wrapping up is great. Uh, that's good. But the, to produce this vaccination in uh, less than a year was miraculous because the speed is unheard of in the industry. And I just wanted to remind you, Stone, that the praise still goes to the previous administrator. Well, That's Donald Trump. Yeah, Operation Warp Speed was a success. Uh, the, and, you know, the previous administrations obviously uh, pushed for that to be implemented. But the real stars are the American taxpayers because how Operation Warp Speed actually worked was um, – the, normally, uh, vaccines take a long time to be developed because in between all the tests, uh, the uh, funding for the tests have to be raised, and they're usually raised privately. There isn't usually public money that's involved. Uh, Operation Works, they picked six or seven companies that they thought had a shot at being successful, and they accelerated all their all their uh, testing because they supplied the money instead of them having to raise it privately. So all the research money was actually U.S. tax dollars that was used to uh, implement this. And so that was there present now. It's the tax dollars that are producing this. So my point is, you still, as, as much as you might would not like to do so, he still deserves a great amount of credit to deliver to the American people this vaccination at the, at the speed that we've gotten it to be. And, of course, Joe Biden is taking it forward, but you still cannot leave off the previous administration. You, you remember when, um, when, when general motors were going under, um, we give Obama credit for coming in saving the general motors. But the first loans came from President Bush before he left office. Most people forget that. They both deserve the credit for saving General Motors, the Bush administration, as well as the Obama administration. But most people give the credit to Obama because they forget about the previous loans that took place on the previous administration. So they both go hand in hand, is all I'm saying. And I won't believe the issue. I just hang up and listen. Oh, okay. Yeah. We appreciate it. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. You know, about that, I, I think Trump probably would have maybe not set himself up for so much criticism in this one area if he hadn't overestimated the rate at which Project Warp Speed would succeed. I mean, he was maybe off by a couple months, but that made it look like he was making it up. Whereas if he had said, well, you know, by the um, end of the year instead of by the election, which I think was what he was fixated on, um, that we would be having lots of people getting vaccinated, I think it would have come out that he was, you know, right on. Well, Vincent is correct. There's a lot of times credit, and I've experienced this myself, that you said a, a, a previous administration has set something up for success, and it eventually, uh, you know, crosses over into the next administration. So that's that's not uh, that's not unusual. Uh, that does happen. I, I experienced that myself with, uh, you know, some of the funding that uh, uh, was carried over from one administration to another when we left office. And that's just how it works. Uh, and you want you want uh, you know uh, success to happen. So. Uh, who gets the credit? Like they say, you can get anything government. To, you can get anything done in government as long as you don't care who gets the credit. So with that, we have a special guest that joins us many times and has been uh, on nine ten himself with the, a new show. That is Greg Dunmore uh, from Pulse Beat Media. And uh, Greg, welcome back to the show and uh, congratulations. Well, thank you, and it's always wonderful to be on the Robert Fatano show. You know, I want to also say that there is something, um, and I'm saying this to the audience because they probably want to hear it from me first, and they're going to hear it from me first because they're listening to the Robert Fecano show. The number 21 is symbolic of success. Um, it's a lucky number. It's a very special number. It promises a life of fulfillment, triumph, and victory, and today is to... 21, 2021. So I'm putting it out there. So if you're listening to the show, do know that something um, that you're going to focus on today is going to be indicative of why 
2021 is going to be an awesome year. So I'm putting that out there. They heard it on the Robert McConnell show. So when the blessing comes this year, remember you heard it on this show first, okay? You got it. You got it. I appreciate it. And also, about, you know, I want to talk about um, what one of the callers said concerning Vice President Harris. And, you know, i got to put my two cents in them. Let's make it maybe sure. three cents. Um, I liked your response concerning when they wanted to challenge whoever is doing it, her blackness in quotes. And then I want to also say that what Tom said made a lot of sense that the bigger issue always transcends the things that separate us, and that is gender and what they call race. And I want to say this because I am a firm believer, and I do understand the term race. I grew up, everybody did, understanding black and white and whatever, okay? But there's only one race, and that's the human race. And this, I think, is so important as we move forward. And I understand that there are cultural dynamics that make the discussion of what's happening to black people culturally and what that symbolizes. When you have the phenotype of what is considered to be black in this country, I really get that. But to challenge her as a black person is ridiculous. I cover arts and entertainment. When they do a movie about Kamala Harris, they're going to cast not a non-black person. They're going to cast a black person to play her you mark my word. And if her lineage was a little different from the southern parts of these United States, having a father who was identified as being black, she would have been enslaved in these United States. But the bigger issue, going back to what Tom said, is that let's not focus on is she black enough. Let's focus on does she think the way that progressive thinkers must think as we move forward in a very challenging time in our lives. So this is where the focus must be. So I appreciate what you said, Bob, that um, is she black enough? Let's just say, isn't that sort of a ridiculous discussion to focus on a woman that we certainly have to applaud her achievement, and we're going to watch her, and we're going to make sure that it's not an issue of is she black enough, is she in tune enough with Americans need in that White House. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. That, that's part of it. In fact, we got some uh, callers here. I think they want to chime in. Uh, next up, we have Theo. Theo, you're on. Mr. Thank you. in the panel. Good morning. Yes, thank you. H- happy Sunday to all of you. I, I wanted to uh, share two things. One, you had a caller who, who <laughs> I had to laugh. He was trying to give credit to Donald Trump for warp speed and vaccinations, but never mentioned the fact that uh, in 2019, the end of the year, where Donald Trump said it was a hoax, oh, there was no such thing as a virus in this country. And then the next thing you know, he says, well, whatever it is, it'll be gone by Easter. And then the next lie he told was, Oh, the Democrats did this. You know, the man was just off his rocker. But um, no mention of his responsibility or his lack of responsibility. Had he faced this issue head on, we may not be where we are today. And I think it's 500,000 people dead because of Donald Trump. Is that the number? Yeah, it's, well, it's approaching 500,000. I mean, 495,000, something like that, will reach 500,000 mm-hmm. uh, that are going to be uh, surpassing it. Yeah, uh, well, let's there's, give him. There's, those that, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's those that argue that this was more Trump losing the election by a lot of his actions versus, you know, people voting for, uh, for Biden, that uh, mm-hmm. people were so upset with uh, Trump that, um, you know, Biden uh, really benefited from that in, in terms of, uh, you know, he he uh, uh, had so many missteps that people, you know, just didn't stand up uh, having him here for another four years. Absolutely. Yeah. But bad. even before we got to the campaign, had he faced this virus head on, 
he would not have 500,000 people dead that he is responsible for. Now, the good news I want to share with you is this coming Saturday, her research is um, sponsoring a caravan on the west side of the city of Detroit. 2019, we did a, a bus black history tour on the east side of Detroit. Of course, we did nothing last year. But people are suffering from cat and fever and, and depression and all kinds of things. But if you do a caravan, everyone is safe in their own vehicle. And you remember the landmark of McKenzie High School? This coming Saturday at 12 noon, we're going to meet at McKenzie High School, West Chicago and Wyoming. And we're going to do a tour of the west side of the city of Detroit, a black history tour. And Greg, oh, you should be joining us. Great. It's okay. free of charge. No, you know. Just in okay. your own car. It's a caravan, so let's say everybody's in their own car. So, mm-hmm. you know, Chicago and uh, Wyoming, yes. I hope that all of you will uh, join us. You don't even have to put your mask on if you're in your own vehicle. Okay. <laughs> but bring right. it with Thank you. you. Thank you. We appreciate it. You have, a, you have a great Sunday. All right. Uh, Greg, uh, before we get to another caller here, um, uh, since you're in the media business, uh, do you think Ted Cruz could have handled his situation any worse than what he has done uh, in terms of leaving uh, the state of Texas while it's in crisis? You know, Captain usually stays with the ship. And, and not that a U.S. senator has as much influence as the governor or or, uh, uh, you know, the lieutenant governor in that type of crisis. But it was such a bad image, and it, it seemed like he was, uh, uh, you know, just so out of tune um, that he didn't realize or maybe didn't care about how this was looking when he was leaving the state and going to Cancun. Then he first tries to blame his kid, but they wanted to go. And then he changed his mind. He switched to... Uh, uh, you know, his ticket right away. He was supposed to stay a lot longer. Uh, so, I don't know, from a PR standpoint, do you, do you see it? Uh, do you see how he could have handled it uh, any worse than what he you know, did? It wasn't a smart move. Um, I think that it was very telling. It speaks volumes about um, his judgment calls. And so I think that it's a no brainer that you don't sit in his position of leadership and jump. If you don't do that, it, um, it was a very poor decision, so he should not have done that. And when you elect to be in the seat that he's in, then you give up the ability to um, jump on a plane and go to Cancun during a situation where your state really needs you. So, no, that was not a very smart thing to do, and it speaks volumes about who he is. What I don't understand yeah. Is why is it that the border of Mexico is opened up now, where people can American tourists can go down to Mexico, but people can't even like just visit family or you know go to work or whatever who um, would typically go back and forth across the Detroit Windsor border. That's a good question, and I would assume that you know the relationship that we have with Canada, which is um, not a third world country, I think that that very well may be indicative to. Canadians and the United States is a higher standard, I believe. I'm not saying that um, there's not a standard that should be respected um, on the Mexican border, but that really is almost an issue of the have and the have not. And Canadians have, and Mexicans have not. Yeah, and it's a part of Canadian government, Scotty, that has put in these uh, restrictions on crossing the border. Uh, and I know it becomes a joint announcement. But it's always the, the lead's always the Canadian officials saying that they, you know, that they want to stop this uh, the border uh, uh, passages uh, until they have more information, more data, and uh, they keep doing it a month at a time. I think another one was just announced. So it, it's just as much the Canadian officials saying that, and they they have much more restrictive situations going on. You, if you you have to have, I believe, a proven. Uh, uh, COVID test uh, before you can uh, come back into the country. You have to uh, quarantine for 14 days once you enter the country. Um, so you just can't uh, cross over. You have to wait 14 days at a certain location. And they actually have a tracking system, I believe, to track that. 
uh, that's part of it. So it, it's it's the Canadian government. And you don't see the Mexican government probably as aggressive about that and, and what they're doing. That's part of it. Uh, we do have another caller here, Brian. Brian, you're on. Hey, man, just a, my whole, just listening to the lineup, I got to respect you by saying, Bob, I'll never forget meeting you downtown, man. You was by yourself. You drove by yourself. You, you, you're a real stand-up guy, man. And the things that I've always heard about you, man, meeting you, <clears throat> excuse me, meeting you personally, man, I never forget a conversation we had. You kept it real with me. You even invited me to come back and talk to you. So to Greg, Greg, you are the knowledge you got, man. You should have been the storyteller. Uh, Doug and should have gave you that budget. <laughs> you and Phil, <laughs> Phil, I know you're still there. If anybody wow. understands our condition and faithful to Detroit, let me tell you something, man. There's not a person. She reminds me of everybody's big mom. So, Phil, if you listen, man, what? let me tell you something. You are the best person to give information. Just think about it. Good research. They really do. And I am going to get involved a little bit more. When I was trying to do my thing for the city, I found out I ran into the wrong enablers. Well, we do need that team, Bob. And, Greg, you guys, I think I call you all the seniors. I'm old, too, but I say the seniors that know the politics. I used to challenge Adolph Mongo to team up with the uh, other little guy. That I call them y'all the political sergeants of Detroit. Y'all know about from the parties, and, um, my bad, from every day that moved in this city, y'all know about it. Why can't you we You know, we're part of the group that team? we have um, um, we did that, done that, and we're still doing it. And I applaud you. As a matter of fact, I'm listening to you. Why take an aspirin when I can listen to a guy like you? I'm taping this conversation, and any time I feel like I have a headache, I'm going to play what you just said. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, Greg, hey, 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 Greg real quick. When we get that, I call it the Detroit Summit, the real summit. When we call the real players in, I mean, seriously, people from old gangsters to people, I don't care who went to jail, got out of jail, y'all really don't know, man. Nine, ten, to put something together. I put, I told Kevin A. Dale that, too. If we do this right, man, in our last days, we only have a.m. Everybody needs to acknowledge that. Look what station we are. I know Kevin was pushing for FM station, but I, I'm comfortable here, too. But until we have the real summit in Detroit, you pick the stadium, bring everybody that's real in this game. We got our own reparations. Put 20 millionaires in this city together, and I guarantee you we don't have to ask the white man for nothing, nobody else, and give us back the land. We'll, we'll develop and put these kids back in the program, uh, building the houses. There's your apprenticeship program. and Start them off at $20 an hour and then elevate them to 60 once they get their uh, German's car. Shout out to I Believe Records, man. Flynn who done it. I'm always going to come real with music and song, but shout out to Bob, you, Greg, and Bill. You are the best. Thank you so much. Thanks, we so appreciate Thanks, it. Man. We appreciate Thanks. it. Appreciate hey, Bob, you know appreciate what I wanted to say, too, that when you said the fun facts, I want to just throw in my little fun fact that WFDF, the call letters, in the, we don't always use WFDF, but it is 9, 10 a.m., Superstation WFDF, and the FDF stands for Frank D. Fallon, which is um, F-A-L-L-A-I-N, and he was actually um, the founder of the call letters uh, before Kevin Adele took over leadership. It was Frank D. Fallon, and so that is why the call letters are WFDF. So that's just another fun fact of those wonderful fun facts that you introduced at the beginning of the show. Now, before we go off, because I know I only have just a few minutes, I wanted to talk about Kim Kardashian because, you know, she's always hot news <laughs> and Kanye West. Well, she finally is doing what everyone thought she was going to do, and that is she is divorcing her husband. They were married for seven years, um, and she's now made the call that she's calling it quits, and Kanye is saying he thinks that the straw that broke the camel's back is the fact that he said he was going to run for the presidency, and um, he thought had he not done that, then they would maybe still be married and wouldn't have, well, I mean, they're still married, but she wouldn't have um, decided that she wanted the divorce. But one thing for sure is I think most of us know that Kanye West and Willie E. Burden, Detroit Police Commissioner, he used to give um, workshops or outreaches regarding mental health. 
And I think that we all know that um, Kanye West has shown public behavior that indicates there's some mental health issues. And I wanted to ask you also something about Kim Kardashian. Now, I think people may know that she is pursuing um, a law degree. And upon further investigation, she never graduated from college. She doesn't have an undergraduate degree. And she is now part of the group of people who become attorneys by, I think it's called reading the law, Bob, and I know you know because you're a lawyer, so she technically is not going to law school, but she's under an apprenticeship, and there are certain states where they allow that to happen. California is one of the states, as would be the state of Washington and I think Vermont. But can you explain to the audience how Kim Kardashian will become an attorney and technically not have attended a law school. She's doing it through apprenticeship. Can you give us a little insight about that, Bob? Because I think yeah, there, there, there might be a little bit of history in terms of, believe it or not, the prison system. By that I mean, uh, if you ever heard the term jailhouse lawyer, yes, uh, that was uh, inmates that actually became very adept at helping other inmates. There's been Supreme Court decisions on this and everything else. Uh, allowing other inmate, uh, jailhouse lawyers to help others um, uh, with their appeal. Um, and many times, see, there's not a natural right. Once your first right of appeal is uh, exhausted, and let's say the court rejects it, many times uh, there's other appeals that continue on, whether it's discretionary or not to the Supreme Court and some of the other ones. If you can become an and, attorney uh, by not technically going to law school, I know that Abe Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson, they were both attorneys, but they technically didn't go to law school, right? They became attorneys through apprenticeship, as did the great attorney um, Clarence yeah. Darrow. Am I saying the last name right? Help me out. Clarence yeah. Darrow. Right? Yeah, I'm not he sure. I, yeah, I'm not sure if he went to law school or not. Well, well, he, did you're right. he, well, he did. He went to law school. He went to Michigan's law school for one year, but he technically never graduated, and this there's something where you can go and become an attorney, as Kim, Kar as Kim Kardashian is doing. She is um, actually getting her law degree because she's doing it through an apprenticeship that in certain states. Now, I know that you went to a legitimate law school, and you got that wonderful degree that gives you the credential, and we're able to call you barrister, attorney, lawyer, counselor. So um, I just know I've been that. Called a lot, I've been called a lot of names, Greg. Go ahead. <laughs> I've been called a lot of names, but that's all right. That's right. <laughs> so you're right. And you know, what I you, you, know Greg, you know, Greg Dunmore, in South Carolina, you can actually run for a justship and never practice law, never got a law license, and you can actually get on the bench. Oh, you can't. Yeah. You can be in South Carolina. You can carry the title judge and technically not have a law background. Now, that's interesting. Well, well, Michigan, Michigan members in the just, bar. Uh, well, the justice of the peace in Michigan, previous to the, uh, some reforms, uh, did not have to have a law degree, justices of the peace, although they would administer laws and, and uh, uh, things like that. That's no longer the case. States like Michigan, you still need uh, the actual uh, certification of having attended law school. And then you, They won't let you take the state bar. Uh, unless you have attended a certified law school, and you have to actually show them the proof of that and everything else that's passed on. Uh, right. Well, that person has a fascinating background. So yeah. she'll divorce um, Kylie West probably, and she will now be um, she's pursuing a new career as an attorney, and so she certainly has an absolutely fascinating background. And another thing I wanted to talk about, because it is Black History Month, that Regina King, who has done such a wonderful job, um, and she's got a film out now, One Night in Miami, which is getting a lot of attention. She's been nominated for a Golden Globe. They say that she will be nominated for an Academy Award as Best Director. That's not been made formal yet. But she just announced that she is going to direct, produce, and star in a film about the legendary life of Congresswoman, the late great Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, who was the first African-American woman to be elected into Congress. And she was also the first black person to run for the presidency 
um, as a major candidate in these United States before Jesse Jackson, who didn't have her background. And so I think it's going to be really a wonderful um, film for those who really need to remember the importance um, historically of what the great Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm symbolizes, and she had a catchphrase, I am unbossed. This is like Commissioner Willie E. Burden. His catchphrase is this, too. I'm unbossed, and I am unbought. Yes. And, you know, um, we'd like you to say a few more minutes, if you can, right after the break. And I know we're about to be on top of it. Uh, Michigan um, Hall of Fame for your uh, journalists. Uh, I, I, during uh, Black History Month, I noticed a person I interacted quite a bit with, Al Allen. Is, uh, oh, he's being, outstanding. He's outstanding. And guess what? I got to just now pat myself on the back. My father, Al Dunmore, who was the editor of, at one time, the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a national black newspaper out of Pittsburgh, of course, and the Michigan Chronicle. My dad was the actual second black person in the state of Michigan that was inducted into this wonderful, the coveted Michigan Hall of Fame for Journalism. And Al Allen will be inducted, as will Felicia Henderson is being inducted, as is um, Susan Whitehall, who was an entertainment writer, she's being inducted. But, yeah, Al Allen, I mean, wonderful guy, and it is such an honor when you are inducted into this Hall of Fame because Michigan, we've had some great journalists, and um, I just – was happening when I heard that Al was being inducted. Yeah, he, uh, now for those that may or that maybe were dating yourself so with age here a little bit, but, but uh, I used to interact with him because he always had the morning shift. He would start like four in the morning, be at the station, and whenever there was some uh, morning interviews and stuff, he would come out. He'd come out to your house or we'd meet at a location, and he was never hesitant to, to do it. And he was a wealth of knowledge, yeah. no matter what the subject was that we were talking about, and to interact with him. And he was always professional. He was a, he, he was a gentleman. I don't know how else to describe it, uh, you know, our interactions together. If you can hold on a few more minutes, Greg, um, you're listening to 910 AM Superstation. My name's uh, Robert Facano, along with our special guest here, Greg Dunmore from Pulse Keep the Media, and our uh, panel of Scotty. Tom and the police mission leader. We'll be right back. Here on Redline, I'm Ben Cole Thompson. Go read my people. Crusader for Justice by George Damon Key, who died fighting for black people, did more for black people than Wendell Anthony will ever do in this nation. But here's what Damon Key said. Wendell Anthony, he's a bully, he's a thug, and he's a two-bit hustler who has used the presidency of the Detroit branch of the NAACP for his own financial and political gain. Wendell Anthony is kneeling before the mayor like a puppy, culturally emasculated leader of the NAACP. You ain't no threat to no status quo. We see through you. And you can only get it here on 910 AM Superstation. Are you looking for a great deal on advertising? Here at 910 AM Superstation, we're going to make you an offer that you can't refuse with our Godfather Package Special. You can receive 200 spots for $500. That's right, 200 spots for only $500. That's $2.50 per spot. All spots must stay within a 30-day schedule. And 910 AM Superstation will produce your spots for free. Please contact Renisha Williams at 313-434-8291. That's 313-434-8291. Please call now. Bonda Evans. For 22 years, you trusted me as your Wayne County judge. Trust me to get the settlement you deserve. Have you been seriously injured in an auto accident and the insurance company refuses to pay you for what you deserve? Lost wages, pain, suffering, and more? Let my team of affiliate attorneys who have collected millions of dollars from insurance companies fight for you. If you don't win, you don't pay. Give us a call today at one 833 Law. A name you know and trust. Davo, the Detroit Association of Black Organizations, is offering COVID-19 testing and a designer clothes giveaway, free food and clothing giveaway, every second Saturday at the Sheffield Center, 12048 Grand River Avenue at Wyoming in Detroit, Michigan, 48204, starting Saturday, February 13th. Free and confidential HIV testing and counseling services are available. For more information, please call Minu Carrie Jones, 313 
888-500-0003. Choose a healthy life, COVID-19, and drive through testing and win our apparel giveaway every fourth Saturday, 9 a.m. until 11 a.m., February 27th at Greater Grace Temple, 23500 West 7 Mile Road, Detroit, Michigan, 48219. You can contact them at greatergrace.org or text GGT to 55469. Partnering sponsors are Greater St. Mark Baptist Church, Third New Hope Baptist Church, the Detroit Association of Black Organizations, and New Destiny Baptist Church. COVID-19 test and designer clothes giveaway, free food and clothing giveaway every second Saturday at the Sheffield Center, 12048 Grand River Avenue at Wyoming in Detroit, Michigan. COVID-19 drive through testing and winter apparel giveaway every fourth Saturday starting February February 27th at Greater Grace Temple, 23500 West 7 Mile Road in Detroit, Michigan. Know your status. Free HIV test also available at the Debo Sheffield Center. For more information about this, call 313-491-0003. Partnering sponsors are Greater St. Mark Baptist Church, Third New Hope Baptist Church, the Detroit Association of Black Organizations, and New Destiny Baptist Church. Know your status. Free HIV test also available at the Debo Sheffield Center. For more information about this, call 313-491-0003. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Good, good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. Uh, for the next couple of minutes, though, we have uh, Brett Dunmore, who's uh, been joining us gracious uh, with his time. We're also, in a few minutes, going to be joined by Dr. Umar Johnson. And uh, if you have questions for him, you can uh, call up at uh, 313-778-7600. That's 313-778-7600. Uh, I believe he is from Philadelphia, has been author of uh, several books, especially in concerning education, and um, uh, he's uh, a, the black uh, parent advocate. Uh, wow. But, uh, wow. Yes, I'm sorry. Hi, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I didn't mean to cut you off, though, um, but can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great, great, yeah. Before I say not goodbye but see you later, um, can I just talk a minute or two about the new show that I'm doing on 910 AM Superstation WFDF? Go ahead, go ahead. You know what, first of all, I want to let the audience know that I am now part of the family, so to speak, and you always make me feel like I'm part of the 910 family whenever I appear on your show and so I always say a big thank you to both you and Commissioner Willie E. Burden for always giving me an opportunity to just do what I do. But um I'm going to be doing a show. It is entitled Can We Talk with Kim and Greg and the Kim is Kim Moore who's a fantastic person with a wonderful background in arts and entertainment herself. And we come on every Thursday from 7 p.m. until 9 p.m., and we're going to be talking about arts and entertainment and what Kim is now, um, she terms it, juicy tidbits. And so we're going to just do our thing. It's going to be lighthearted. We're going to get deep, but we're going to basically talk about arts, entertainment, and culture, and we're going to keep it hot and happening. And I've been blessed to have a wonderful journey in this business called radio. I was trained by the legendary Martha Jean the Queen. And then Mildred Gaddis allowed me to sit in her chair and to pick up what she has done so well for so many years. And then you also, um, when we talked about Larry King and you said, well, you were um, on his show before, and I said, well, there's something about you and Larry King that I see a similarity. I don't like doing your show, Bob. I love doing your show because there's an energy that you bring as a host of a radio talk show that is outstanding. You're a great listener, you're a great interviewer, and you're a nice guy, but you still hold your own. So you've got also that stand that when I think about what I'm doing, I take notes when I listen to you. So do know when I do this show, can we talk with Kim and Greg every Thursday from 7 p.m. until 9 p.m.? I am channeling. Martha Dean the Queen, Mildred Gaddis, and Robert Fakano. 
<laughs> you're kind, you're kind, you're kind, Greg. Well, that's, that's going to be an exciting show. Is that mostly going to center on entertainment? Or what, yeah, we're going to focus uh, on gonna... entertainment. And, you know, they said when we got the call that um, we got a call from Kevin, and he said that he really wanted the show to be done, Mr. Adele. And um, he said, I want kind of, I want something that's, Fun and you know you do a little gossip and I want arts and entertainment. I want you to keep it hot and live. So our focus is really going to be um, arts, entertainment, culture, celebrity, and lifestyle. And we may talk a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We've got some fun things that we plan on doing, but it's really a wonderful platform. Radio, no matter what comes and goes, there is something about radio that is magical when you can hear the voice. And I'm from the old school when I had a transistor radio. Now, uh, for those who are not seasoned enough to remember what that <laughs> would be, look it up, a transistor radio. But there is still something really very charismatic about hearing voices, and then you pick up the energy of the voice and you visualize, and it causes the brain to visualize. So I think that radio is very healthy because it really does exercise the brain by forcing you to have images that I think are healthy when the brain sometimes can be not as um, worked as it needs to be because everything is so visual. So there is something spiritual and magical still about this idiom, um, this mechanism that we call radio. So I'm excited. Well, we appreciate it. You know, before, we still have a, a couple of minutes, Dr. Uh, Umar Johnson is going to be joining us. And like I said, you can uh, you have questions for him at 313-778-3600. Or for Greg at this point. Uh, and he was completely on the opposite end of the spectrum that I'm on and a lot of others are on. I know that from Willie to uh, Scotty to uh, uh, Tom as well, uh, is um, Rush Limbaugh passed this week. And yet... At the same time, we have to recognize that he sort of revolutionized uh, uh, talk radio in a way that a lot of people, whether you like it or not, I mean, just from an entertainment standpoint, uh, had an impact uh, on, on people listening uh, to the radio just with the number of uh, people that he actually had to listen and things like that. Like I said, politically, from the spectrum, he's the opposite of a lot of us. But, I mean, from an entertainment standpoint, he seemed to generate a lot of success. Now, that you know what you're listen. saying. This makes you a nice guy because I'm going to tell you that I posted something, and I said that Rush Limbaugh is dead. And then I said that now that he is no longer with us, now that he is no longer with us, who will fill his shoes? And then I said, let us hope nobody. Now, I said that <laughs> based on this ideology because I do believe that, Rush Limbaugh and the ideology, I couldn't embrace it. I just, I would, I would be a hypocrite if I um, said I embraced his ideology. But you are making still a very objective point, and this is what a good journalist will do. You know, you have to look at both sides as a personality, the energy that he had. Certainly, he was someone that made you listen to him, even though you may not have liked what he was saying. I don't like what he was saying. But as a radio personality, he had the energy and he had that it factor, whether you like the it. And some people could add two letters before the IT and turn them into something else, and you know where I'm going. But nevertheless, um, Russ Limbaugh, yeah, I think anybody that is studying this biz called radio, he would certainly be a personality that one would say there were many things that he did that made him very engaging as a radio personality. So now I don't feel so bad because they say you should always say something nice about the dead, so I just did. <laughs> so another important personality from um, broadcasting that died recently was Art Servi. And oh, it was real confusing to me because there are so many different bozos, but he was the one who did the Bozos Big Tap show. Well, they also had a guy called Mr. Houdini, who definitely was not the original famous magician, but um, was a magician character on the show. And he was like, well, always broadcast out of Windsor. Um, and so it was a CBC program, Channel 9. And apparently that he, he um, had come on the air for a very long run. 
um, as that character. Before that, there was another guy playing Bozo briefly in Detroit, and that's the first Bozo I remember seeing, who later became Oopsie the Clown because of the unconscious. Oopsie the Clown, oh, wow. And what about Melfi the Clown? Bob, do you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, was yeah. Twin yeah. And he was like the... You do remember Melfi the, the Clown. Does that ring a bell or not? <laughs> yes, definitely. He, he was another one, but... Uh, uh, you know, the most famous run with uh, Scotty Payne Jock is, uh, was Bozo the Clown. He, uh, I understand reading about him that he actually would demand that he get picked up from his house because he was fully uh, in his clown outfit. Right. And then uh, go to the studio because he didn't want the kids to see who he was uh, and, and be disappointed that it was someone other than uh, Bozo eventually. Is someone were watching him going back and forth to the studio, and he wasn't dressed in his clown outfit, I guess. I mean, the little kids, when we were um, younger, it was Captain Kangaroo. Does that ring a bell? It was wow. Rapper Room. Does that ring a bell? It was Bozo yeah. with the red hair. And I wonder, who are the little kids today? Um, who are their heroes on TV? Who do they watch? I wonder. Uh, well, they're probably watching the video game and some of your characters on the video right, game. Right. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They're watching the video. But I think that it's something when you kind of give uh, a flashback of when we were kids and on um, TV, you would wake up and watch cartoons. Remember cartoons were very popular and on Saturday in the morning before your parents got up? Cartoons were always what we did, and whether it was Mighty Mouse or um, the Jetsons or the Roadrunner, they just had these classic cartoons, and it was another age. But as you talked about the fun facts of what was going on um, in the beginning of this station in 1922, then it kind of makes you just think about the good old days, and there were some things about the good old days that really were good. No, I, they say historically people think of uh, the past as uh, always sort of uh, very positive and don't realize some of the past that was very negative that impacted their lives as well. People want to think about good things. People by nature want to, to, to think of good things that have happened in their life and not necessarily they suppress the, the bad things that, uh, you know, realistically were just as impactful as, as the good things that they remember. Every generation says you know, the good old days. Every generation says it. And uh, there's just different days all the time. Unless maybe you're a Detroit Lions fan because right. there's no real good days. <laughs> you're making a really good point because there was the movie on the, um, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And when I looked at that title, I thought, now, you've got the good, but then you have the bad and the ugly. That's not balance. So I always like to look at things from the great, the good, and then the bad and the ugly, and I say that kind of quiet because I like to talk about what is great, what is good, and then we'll just, you know, we're analyzing the bad and the ugly, and that gives full balance. But I think, yeah, that when you look um, at what was good about those bygone days, that there's always something, and this is a life lesson that, and you talked about Russ Limbaugh, I think anybody that is healthy um if they can, and there are only a few things that you really can't really find any good, but any time you find the good in anything that is not just sort of being absolutely diabolical, I believe it's healthy because we are humans, right? And part of being humans, that we're all flawed. So there's always something about anything that we do that certainly isn't going to be perfect. There's only perfection in God. Yes. And, and before we, before a few more words, um, the the, and I'm, I'm switching a little bit here, Greg. But you're an expert on the media and things like that. Are you surprised how the media has turned on New York Governor Cuomo at this point? He won an Emmy for what he was doing during the pandemic, and now. It looks like they're trying to run him out of office. No, not surprised at all. And you also know. Now, for the audience, and I was so glad when the caller called and he talked about you, Bob, as being such a great guy because you really are a good person. But I think you know also a person who has been in the public spotlight for many years. 
before I had a chance to really formally meet you, I always knew about you because everybody knows about certain names, and you were part of the names in this city that everybody knows. So be it a Coleman Young that everybody knows or Robert Ficano, everybody in the spotlight is going to be at one time loved by the press and then attacked by the press because that is the nature of the beast of media. And I think that for anybody who is listening and they think that, oh, it's a glamorous thing to be spotlighted by the media, be it a television person or a print person in the newspaper, never be fooled by this game. And don't you know it well? Attorney Robert Picano, yes, very well. The spotlight. You're going to get people that will pat you on the back and they will tell you how much they love you. And the media might write about that, but they're also eventually going to go for the attack. They do it to everybody, and that is the nature of the beast. You're darned if you do, and you're darned if you don't. So I do like Governor Cuomo, and I mean, I don't think there's been any politician that has not been under the scrutiny of the media where if they're a good guy or gal, that they're going to be embraced and they're going to be elevated, but they will also be attacked. And I know on this panel the um, good commissioner, Willie E. Burden, as he is going to journey, and I hope that he's going to seek another political position because he's very good at what he does, but be prepared for the attack by the media, because that is part of the way it happens. Am I telling a lie, Attorney Robert McConnell? No, no, they, they eventually always do turn on you very, very much. Well, i tell you what, Greg, we have uh, Dr. Rumor Johnson, who's uh, just called in. I appreciate you spending your time with us. I know your new show is coming up on Thursdays from 7 to 9 on, on 9, 10 a.m., and we want to wish you all the best. So always going to be invited back here. So and can I leave the audience with just one last thing before I say I'm going to listen to the rest of the show. But when people throw stones at you, don't throw them back. Pick <laughs> them up and build a castle, if not an empire. You've got it, Greg. We appreciate it. That's Greg Dunbar from uh, Pulse Beat uh, Media. So appreciate it, Greg. You take care. Uh, we are now going to be joined by Dr. Umar Johnson. And, and you can reach him if you have questions at 313-778-7600, uh, 313-778-7600. And uh, Dr. Johnson, welcome back to the show. We appreciate you joining us here this morning. Good morning. Glad to be back. Thank you. And just so you know, we do have a, a panel, uh, the D uh, Detroit Police Commissioner Willie Burton, as well as uh, Tom Chosky and uh, Scotty Bowman. But uh, once Education has been uh, in the forefront of, uh, especially here in Detroit, about opening up with the pandemic and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And are people, or I shouldn't say people, are our kids really uh, falling behind uh, in the system that we have set up now, where um, uh, they're perhaps doing some online, but we know there's a discriminatory amount of online that broadband. I, I teach myself at a community college and even trying to get students with solid broadband sometimes can be a challenge because uh, we're teaching some of the classes and some things like that. So just, just what are some of your impressions about what's uh, going on, how it's uh, affecting uh, communities such as Detroit, Philadelphia, and things like that where we see a real struggle perhaps in, in, the, in the education system at this point? Great question. First of all, the virtual learning experiment has been a dismal failure nationally. That's one of the reasons why so many parent groups, parent organizations, community-based organizations, have, and even educational organizations and teachers, the ones who care, they have been fighting for the children to return back to the classroom because the virtual learning does not work. I already knew this, because children are supposed to be taught by people directly. Education is a transactional activity. You learn in first person, not through the computer. And so if you look in the suburbs, a lot of suburban schools, the students have already 
return back. A lot of private schools have had their students back in school full time since the beginning of the year. Where we see the greatest lapse or lag, rather, is in predominantly black school districts where a lot of the teachers really couldn't care less, you know. And so I do understand the risk that COVID poses. But at the same time, when I look at the schools that have already allowed the students to come back, even if only on a hybrid schedule, say Tuesday and Thursday at school, Monday and Wednesday and Friday at home, there has been no outbreak of COVID. There has been no deaths, hospitalization. So we clearly see from the schools that have allowed students to return that there is really no significant concern with COVID. And I support the children going back to school, even if it's only on a hybrid schedule. I'm presuming and I, I, I see that President Biden is struggling with uh, some of the commitments they made early on about when youngsters were going to be able to return to or schools were going to be able to open up and youngsters engage in the classroom. Uh, it would seem kind of strange that they sort of said, well, now it's not, it's not really a full return. It's uh, 50% of the schools will go one day a week. Uh, we'll let you go off. Uh, we'll let you go. Uh, you know, on that subject. But first, we do have to take a break. I apologize. Uh, but uh, you're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation, and uh, you're listening to Dr. Umar Johnson. We're going to be right back after these few words, and you can call him at 213-778-7600. We'll be right back. <laughs> Center for Justice by George Damon Kidd, who died fighting for black people, did more for black people than Wendell Anthony will ever do in this nation. But here's what Damon Kidd said, Wendell Anthony, he's a bully, he's a thug, and he's a two-bit hustler who has used the presidency of the Detroit branch of the NAACP for his own financial and political gain. Wendell Anthony is kneeling before the mayor like a puppy, culturally emasculated leader of the NAACP. You ain't no threat to no status quo. We see through you. And you can only get it here on 910 AM Superstation. Detroit Soul voted top five best soul food restaurant in Metro Detroit by Vote for the Best 2020. Try our homestyle daily offerings of fried chicken, baked turkey wings, smothered pork chops, meatloaf coupled with made-from-scratch mac and cheese, cornbread dressing, and sweet candied yams with many more of your traditional favorites. Exclusive weekend special features signature outdoor barbecue experience with our succulent cherry smoked barbecue spare ribs and juicy half barbecue chicken, satisfying the most critical barbecue lover. Detroit Soul offers catering services for all business, corporate, public, and home events. Located at 2900 East 8 Mile Road between DeQuinder and Ryan. Closed Monday, open Tuesday through Friday, noon to 8 p.m. Saturday, 11 to 8 p.m. Sunday, 2 to 6 p.m. Visit DetroitSoul.net. The same care placed in the cooking process is also invested into the customer service experience. Gotta get you some. Shady Auto Sales, how can I help you? I need a car today, but I'm letting you know right now my credit is not that good. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll need a blood sample, 20 credit references, wait two weeks, then you do the hokey pokey. And what? That is ridiculous. I'm calling A&B Motors. You need to drive today? Call me first at 586-445-1600. My name is Al Tiano, and I'm from A&B Motors at 12 and a half Marlin and Gratiot in Roseville and 2253 Dixie Highway in Waterford. I have 2020s, 19s, 18s in stock right now, ready for your immediate delivery. Cousin Jimmy here. There's no need to wait. I can get you approved for auto financing in just three minutes, even if you have bad credit. I've helped thousands of people, and I can help you too. Just call us now, 586-445-1600. Go to my website, abmotors.biz. Three minutes, and you're in it. So what are you waiting for? Call me first and drive today, 586-445-1600. 910, the super station. The oldest radio station in town since 1922. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the super station. We are the supporters to have, fortunate to have Dr. Umar Johnson. My name is Robert Cano, along with Tom Trotsky. Gabby Bowman and Police Commissioner Louis 
Burton. And we have a number of callers that want to talk to you, uh, Doctor. But before we do, just your your impression of what the president proposed or uh, his, his press secretary as well about the 50 per, uh, 50% of the schools will be open one day a week uh, as, as saying that was the commitment that, that he's making at this point. One of the reasons that President Biden is taking such a cautious approach to public school reopening is because he carried both of the major teacher unions during this election. He received both the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association. And we know that the job of the teachers' union is to make the teachers' jobs as simple and as easy as possible. And most and both unions totally are opposed to their teachers going back. And I would argue that it's not so much about COVID as it is about teacher laziness. I mean, they haven't been to work in a year. You know, the quarantine began March of 2020. We're almost to March of 2021, so the teachers have not been inside of the school building for 12 full months, and they are hoping that they can push this thing out until the summer vacation. And the last thing the president wants to do is upset the union who played a very large part in his election. Let us remember that the teacher unions of America are the largest unions in the country only rival by the police. So if you ever wonder why, we see very little change in the schools and very little change in community policing. It's because everybody's afraid of the teachers and everybody's afraid of the police. Okay. Well, we have a number of callers that want to talk to you. Uh, Maryland, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, good morning. Dr. Johnson, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, schools should not be reopened, especially in the underserved communities. The ventilation systems need to be updated in these schools. Uh, they need to be sprayed uh, with whatever disinfectant they use in the hospitals and airplanes. Masks should be the same quality as doctors for the staff and students. And uh, new hospitals and new schools need to be built in the underserved communities. And also the buses need to be sanitized, too, because the little fingers, they touch the doors, they touch the seats. And like I said, it, it's just the underserved communities that, that's going to be the worst. And uh, thank you for taking my call, and I hope I didn't talk too fast because I know other people are trying to um, reach the show. Okay. Dr. Johnson? Well, I would agree. I believe the Queen Mother said that the school should be open. And I agree with that. I also agree that the schools physically need to be overhauled. I agree with that. I believe the curriculum needs to be overhauled. I think the whole system needs to be overhauled. But until black parents get organized and start showing up in mass to the school board meetings, nothing's going to change. But until the black community gets organized and start voting on a black platform as opposed to a Democratic platform or a Republican platform, we're not going to get anywhere and last, but most importantly, until we use our money in order to leverage our political power, we're never going to get anywhere. Black people are the only people in America who refuse to organize their dollars in order to achieve cultural power. The teacher art schools are open. It's just the colleges that are closed. <laughs> the I've been teaching well, the schools. Well, some of the, some of the, some of the, not all the public schools are open at this point. In fact, the governor did not give a hard line. She said she'd like to see them all open by March 1st, but there's no, no real um, uh, incentive. By that I mean, fi- I mean financially or anything that says you have to open by that time. They're still leaving, leaving it up really to the discretion of the school boards uh, locally the way that it's set up. There are. And there's a lot of the, uh, a lot of school districts in Michigan are split, meaning they go they go to school for two or three days out of the week, and then they uh, they virtually have uh, uh, 
you know, uh, opportunity or the, vir- the remaining two days are done virtually. They're done on the computer. It's part of it. I think Dr. Johnson, which I'm uh, arguing, and it makes a lot of sense, is that a lot of uh, the instruction has to be face-to-face because that's the way that youngsters are going to learn the best at this point. I mean, I mean, an imagine, imagine a five- or six-year-old kindergartner trying to learn uh, at home listening to the listening to the teacher by way of Zoom or Google Classroom. Just imagine how difficult that can be, especially in the primary grade. From kindergarten to third grade, these children have to try to pay attention through a computer to a teacher who's probably already boring and disinterested in the first place. I mean, you're asking children to do the impossible. I, I know this from personal experience with my grandkids that it's difficult because both parents are working and they're trying to make a commitment. Uh, they have youngsters that are in the K-3 to range, and the youngsters' attention span really wanders. In fact, it's very difficult for them to stay on a computer for any length of time as you would during the normal school day. And they, they, they're spending as much time with the child getting them to focus as they do uh, anything else that's, that's uh, going on in the, in the household that day. It's, it's a real difficult thing for that to happen. Uh, next up, Marathon, you're on with Dr. Johnson. Hello, how are you this morning? Good. All is well. Uh, I have I have something on my mind. Um, our Chaldean and Arab uh, community with the stores, they're being very insensitive. Uh, I came in this morning, you know, it was very cold. First of all, I had a lot of pennies on me, and I was trying to get dollars for pennies. They treated me like I had the plague because I didn't have the pennies wrapped up. Uh, I had them wrapped in paper. They were all pennies and pennies still spin. Then they wouldn't let me get they wouldn't let me get warm. I was waiting for the bus, and the uh, the owner he all but tried to shoot me. Okay. That's what I have to say. All right, thanks, Marathon. Uh, obviously, we're trying to focus here on the education with Doctor uh, with Doctor Johnson. Shamil, uh, Shamil, with Doctor Johnson. Yes, how y'all doing? Okay, then, uh, I heard y'all was talking about, uh, is the school safe? I wish I could have uh, California time on three hours back. Three hours back, I have Savannah three-way. A friend of mine who put her school, when she was living in New York, working in California, Oakland, she put her nine-year-old child in school. We're talking about uh, two, a month ago, just recently. And uh, what happened was the nine-year-old child, within two weeks, was coming home, throwing up, fever 105. The child was so sick, she rushed into the house cover. The child was the child was positive for the virus. The whole school was affected. Two of the teachers end up in the house, fellow, and I want her to explain it. And she's blessed because she got minor ill from it. Her child directly down the day is still very ill from the virus. They all come down with coronavirus. Now, for Connor, it went three hours back next week. I would love to get her on the phone, the, the plan, to explain to you what happened with California. I would do it now, but the time is so far back behind. Now, everyone in the school is affected with this virus. It's just recent now. So, you know, the school's safe. What common can I ask? Well, look, you look on social media, see all these people in these basement parties, 20 and 30 and 40 people, they in their 30s and 40s. Keep in mind that we complain about they are spreader, though they have school-age children now. Keep in mind now, it's not the kids affected the parents. The parents are coming home affected the children. And they're sending the children to the school with everyone else's child, and the, and, the, and if the teachers end up in the house for the two of them. Everyone in, in the whole uh, class has this virus. And I was shy. I would put her, I tell you what, for Kwana next week, I tried to get on three way and have her call to talk to y'all to give you more of what went down, okay? Schools are not safe. I mean, you say in the white server and school them, yes. I mean, it's beneficial, it's white privilege. They, gonna, they got the best schools. They, they can take a chance on the virus. I mean, they got ventilation up to date schools. The best of everything, all your lottery money went to the server, to the, uh, the server in schools. So they went, well, look at our schools. All of them, look at the schools, no ventilation. So you can't uh, put these children back in school. The school system felt our children away before the pandemic. So we had a pandemic in our school years before that. You know, so the education system felt the black man anyway. 
So we don't, so if they out of school, what damn difference to make it? School not teaching us anything. Y'all have a blessed day. And the whole school, okay. they, they have the virus. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jackson, I, I think a little bit up your alley in terms of uh, African Americans actually organizing and, and pushing their own agenda versus uh, the school districts perhaps that are failing them uh, that, are, uh, that are in the system right now. Absolutely. Uh, black parents have, have never been organized in any meaningful way in American history. Black teachers have never been organized in any meaningful way in black history. I'm amazed that we still haven't had a movement to create a national black teachers union. That is something that is long overdue. But speaking to the last caller's comment, when I say that the children should return to school, I am not saying that we ignore social distancing. So a school that normally accommodates 500 children would now accommodate 200, maybe 250. And those other children can then go to the churches. There's a lot of other buildings, commercial structures in our communities that are not being used or that can be rented for the children and the teachers to go in there during the day to receive their instruction. So we're not going to ignore social distancing. The schools will be at half capacity, and then the other half of the students can be taught in other places that can be rented by the school district. Here's the point that I want to make, going back to what I said earlier. For the schools that have returned, even in the black community, on a hybrid basis, there have been almost no concerns about COVID outbreak or transmission. So we already have some documented evidence that the children can go back to school and not get sick. But furthermore, the black community needs to be very careful because if we're saying that our children cannot go back to school until COVID has been totally eradicated and nobody knows what that date is, you're basically saying that public education as we know it for black children is going to be over. And the three problems I have with that is, number one, our parents need a break. 67% of all of our children are being raised by single mothers who are stressed out, depressed, self-medicating, have issues of their own, and they need a break. That's number one. Number two, a lot of our children live in dysfunctional households where there's emotional abuse, physical abuse, but unfortunately, in some cases, even sexual abuse. The children need a break. They're not getting any exercise. They're getting a poor diet. And so there's a lot of other factors we need to consider about not letting our children go back to school that are just as important, if not more important, than receiving an education. Now, one thing I noticed is a lot of the, um, when I've been in the different schools, I substitute teach, I get different schools at different grade levels. And the ones with the very young kids, like first grade and kindergarten and so on, those are the rooms that are basically full. And then it's, um, as they get older, they start to kind of, you know, rotate people in and out as partial full-time and partial, I mean, partial face-to-face and partial virtual. So I think maybe a lot of people do feel the same way, that the young people need that face-to-face contact as they're getting it. Yeah, and after one of the issues that meeting, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I didn't have any. One of the issues that comes up about one of the issues that comes up is um, listening to your example is that if you were to spread the youngsters to say you cut the school uh, building in half in terms of. Uh, number of kids that come in, and then you put the other half in churches and stuff, wouldn't you have to double and triple the staff to be able to do that? And that financially becomes uh, difficult to do for a lot of these school districts. Um, I don't think you have to double the staff because the regular classroom teacher would go with their students, but I understand what you're saying because if you're splitting the school in half, then yes, you would need to double the staff or... You could use uh, teachers' aides 
okay? You can use para professionals. There's ways around it. There's definitely ways around it. You got to remember now, in many of our schools, a lot of the people in the classroom are emergency substitutes and long-term substitutes. In the average inner-city African-American school, less than half of the teachers are actually certified. So when you talk about the COVID layoffs and so many people in need of jobs, do you know how quickly people would jump up to get some of these long-term substitute jobs to go and teach some of these children? So that would not be a problem at all. You would actually be taking care of two problems at once, not only the education of our children, but you will also be doing something to reduce the unemployment that is rampant in our communities as well. Okay. We have a number of callers, and we're trying to get to them all. Lori, Lori, you're on with Dr. Johnson. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to commend uh, Dr. Umar. I really like the concept about the uh, school that he has committed to opening. Also, um, I would like to know if he can give us some information or share some information about the vaccine that uh, is going around. And also, I want to know when is he planning to come back to Detroit and give us a little lecture on how things are going with the school. Thank you. A great question. With regard to the vaccination, I am not a medical doctor, but I am a student of political history. I am a student of eugenics. And when you look at our history in this country with vaccination and medical experimentation without our knowledge and deliberate attempts by the United States government to reduce our numbers, that is enough for me to mistrust this vaccination. There's already enough information out there that would lead even the most conservative person to question whether or not they should be taking it. There's been people who have taken the vaccination who have discussed the side effects that they have had from taking the vaccination. I do not trust it. I do not like it. I will not be taking it myself. Uh, With regard to me returning to Detroit, uh, I will be coming back. It will probably be at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. And I will also be coming to a restaurant in Easter, Michigan, where I have never been before. So I'm just coordinating the date. So it'll probably be late March, early April. But again, it'll probably be Mandy's Knowledge Cafe and a black-owned uh, restaurant in Inkster, Michigan. Okay. Inkster is a, a, nice, a very nice community in Wayne County. So I think you're going to enjoy that, uh, being there. Larry, Larry, you're on with Dr. Johnson. Gentlemen, thank you for taking my call. Dr. Johnson, I'll be uh, really quick. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I'm very concerned in regards to what we're passing off as education. I'm also concerned about what we're passing off as teaching and teaching to black children in particular. You know, Dr. Johnson, there are things that, that, that we need to be aware of. There are alerts that we need to, uh, to, to be able to follow and acclimate in our own families, in our own homes. But uh, what they're passing off for education, I'm very concerned about public education. I'm concerned about Afrocentric education. And I'm also concerned that we are allowing this particular government, this system, to, to uneducate our children if that is any way possible. Thank you, sir, for taking my call. I'll listen up there for your comments. I totally believe that, first of all, I believe it is psychologically and spiritually impossible to properly educate black children or supervise the education of black children. So I'm speaking of teachers, principals, and administrators. It is psychologically and spiritually impossible for them to do that. White privilege demands that black children be miseducated in order to protect the opportunities for white children. There is no white person in America that is going to prepare a black child to compete on an equal plane with their own. It's just not going to happen. So the solution is for black people to build their own schools. Look at all the schools that are closed in Detroit, closed in Philadelphia, closed in Chicago, closed all across this country. We should have been to purchase all of those schools and turned them into independent, community-operated and managed institutions. The bottom line is black people are not going to spend any money on anything that the white man already provides for them 
no matter how poorly in quality it is being provided. Until the white man shuts down public schools, the black man will not build his own schools. Uh, also, Dr. J- Dr. Johnson, um, Dr. Umar Johnson, this is Commissioner Willie Burton. You know, I agree with you on 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 a hundred percent on so many different levels. You know, I'm um, you know reading your book, Black Parent Advocate, uh, the Art of War, dealing with American public and charter schools. On page uh, 76 in your book, um, you mentioned uh, black parents need to be very careful what they put into, you know, what they allow doctors to put in their, you know, put in their children's uh, system. And so right now, you know, kids are going to be returning back to school. Um, In addition to that, uh, they're trying to get children vaccinated by this summer. I'm against the vaccination myself. I'm telling my constituents to stand down on it. Um, Can you elaborate a little bit more on that as well? Because uh, right now, you know, this vaccine just killed and took it out a good pioneer right here in the city of Detroit. It was a reporter uh, by the name of Karen Hudson um, Samuel. She took the vaccine. Two, a day or two days later, she's dead. And now they're talking about putting, giving our children vaccine, COVID vaccine that haven't been properly tested. In, in 1974, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger penned the National Security Study Memorandum 200. I recommend that everybody download it and read it. This was the first large-scale population study of any nation in the world with regard to predicting population growth across the planet. No other, co- no other country thought it was necessary to find out how many people were being born across the world so they could control it. And in that study, it basically said that too many black people were being born in the world and that it is a significant security risk for the United States government, domestically and internationally. A few years later, when Jimmy Carter became president, he published another population study, which was known as Global 2000. Again, I recommend that people pull it up, download it, and read it. Both of them are a couple hundred pages, I believe. And basically, that study was more aggressive because it said the United States of America needs to take the lead to control population in the world. Right after Global 2000 was released, the first documented case of HIV AIDS was discovered. No coincidence whatsoever. This COVID is a population control weapon. And the main reason they released it is because there's too many old people who are living longer than usual. And becoming an elder is usually a good thing, but not when you're black and not when it comes to capitalism. Under capitalism, the only people who are worth anything are those who can work for you and those who can buy from you. If you cannot work for me, if I cannot exploit your labor, And if I cannot exploit your pocketbook, you are useless. And that's why capitalists don't like the elderly, because the elderly become dependent on the society because they can no longer have their labor exploited. Africa is home to the largest population of elderly people in the world. One of the reasons Italy got hit so hard with the COVID is because Italy is home to the oldest European population in the world. And if you look at who's dying in America, it is the African-American elderly. The African-American elderly who are being hit the most with this COVID situation. It is on purpose. It is by design. And we are living in a 21st century African Holocaust being disguised as a medical crisis. Okay, we have a number of callers still want to talk to you, Doctor uh, Rodney. Rodney, you're on with Doctor Johnson. Hey, Doctor Johnson, this is Rodney Day uh, from Grand Rapids, uh, program director for the E. How you been doing? All is well, brother. Oh, good hearing from you again. A uh, couple questions for you, Doc. I mean, as a black parent, and I, I know Willie Burton, and I know uh, Scotty Bowman, 
a big shout out to them and a, a big shout out to Bob for coming to the show. Uh, I have been struggling uh, with my son. Uh, the last report card that he had was just about all Fs. Normally he's a 3.8 student. Uh, it's his first year of high school. Uh, obviously, this virtual learning experience has been tough. I just got his new second semester progress report uh, today uh, in the mail, uh, and it's been kind of similar to what happened uh, with his grades this last uh, past semester. What do I do uh, as a parent? Because I don't really know what to do anymore. I have my son half the week. His mom has a master's degree. She's ironically a teacher. She's at home teaching him. Uh, he's doing the work, so I know he's turning in his assignments when we go on the uh, virtual class uh, uh, report that we're getting back, uh, you know, from the teachers. We're going to the uh, office hours with the teachers. We've been talking to the, uh, the teachers, uh, just communicating as far as, uh, you know, his grades and whatnot. But, I mean, the issue that we're having is the quizzes uh, that he turns in, we're not getting those results back for three or four weeks. So, I mean, at this point, I don't really know what to do. Dr. Johnson? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought his call got interrupted a little bit there. Um, okay. Uh, he's basically frustrated because he doesn't feel uh, his child was a um, uh, 2.8, uh, um, you know, grade point child. Ever since the pandemic and some of the remote uh, virtual learning, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's gone down to all else. And it sounds like part of the problem is the feedback uh, that takes three or four weeks for the teachers to, to grade the quizzes, which doesn't give you the immediate feedback that, there's, that there may be a problem with what's being comprehended or what's being learned. So he's wondering if you have any suggestions for him. Well, the good thing about education is it's one of the oldest institutions in the world. And in America, it's one of the oldest institutions as well. Where, you know, the church started the first schools, and the church is like the oldest institution in the world to some degree, as old as government. And so a parent who wants to get started can go online, literally, to Barnes & Noble or any bookstore, the black bookstores as well, and you can actually get an entire curriculum for your child's grade. Literally, in one book, everything a fourth grader should know about math, everything a fourth grader should know about science, everything a fourth grader should know about history and civics, everything a fourth grader should know about language. Because, you know, homeschooling is a very big business in America, very big. And so no parent should feel at a loss for how to educate their children. All you have to do is go online, order the necessary book, and go ahead and start educating your child. Homeschooling has never been easier than it is today because you have so many prepackaged curriculums that you can simply just buy offline and get started. So I recommend that parents do that. And if they need further consultation, they can reach out to retired teachers, current teachers who are also home. And, of course, I'm always available to consult with parents as well with regard to homeschooling their children. So, Dr. Umar, if this pandemic keeps on going on, should I just – it seems like since my son is at home, I might as well homeschool him, I mean, because the, the education that he's getting right now in the classroom is most certainly not working. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you all. I really do believe that the black community should get organized enough where we go to the school board and we go to the governor in each state because ultimately education is the prerogative of the governor, lieutenant governor, state school board, state secretary, and chancellor of education. I think we should get organized and we should go to the school, excuse me, to the state government and say, listen, if you guys are not going to let the teachers back in the school, no problem. Schools, go into the school. Yes, sir. Dr. Johnson, you also mentioned in your book um, about how students, um, you know, are entitled to due process. Um, you know, um, and you also talks about, you know, 
uh, meeting with, you know, request to meet with the school board. In a situation like this, uh, would parents reach, re, re, reach out to the school board and want to know why their child was performing very well at one point and now due to distance learning, uh, a child was well, here under performing? Well, here's the thing, though. This was the thought that I uh, wanted to articulate a moment earlier. We should demand that the state require the school districts to open up the schools to the community and allow us to educate our own children. Remember, every crisis is an opportunity in disguise. If the teachers don't want to come back, no problem. Do you know how many black people would volunteer to go into the classroom for just one day a week and we could rotate and that would give all the adults in the community who have something to teach our children an opportunity to teach them. We can educate them ourselves until such time that they deem it necessary for the unionized teachers to return to the schools. I think that would be a perfect, perfect solution to this situation if the black community said, your teachers don't want to come back, no problem. Let us in. We'll educate our children ourselves. This is a potential opportunity for us. But as you know, I don't know if our people are up to the task. Well, we have a little bit of right before the end here. Uh, let's get the, some of the calls. Kwame, Kwame, you're on with Dr. Johnson. Yeah, you know, Dr. Johnson, I, I agree with you. You know, uh, a lot of things is pretty nefarious. Uh, are going on, and I definitely agree with you. Black teachers have much more of an affinity with black students. But, um, you know, we have to find out what works and what is safe at the same time. Uh, if you got students going to school and they're, they're not being affected by COVID-19, what is the problem with our schools? We have to check. We have to find out what is the, the issue then. You know, and I, I believe well, in community control. I beg your pardon? Oh, no, I'm with you, brother. Go ahead. I, I agree with you. Continue. Yeah, I believe in community control. But, you know, like, there's a, a group called American um, Frontline Doctors. Now, you, they believe the whole thing is a hoax. And they agree with you that most of the people that are dying from COVID-19 are really dying from other things, and they're all black folks and all white folks. And the whole thing, you might want to look them up, uh, American Frontline Doctors Dr. Kanam. But um, to our listening audience, you want to pick up the book today, Black Parent Advocates. You want to pick up the book today. Dr. Morris Johnson, let people know how they pick up the book today, Black Parent Advocates. Uh, Yes, sir. They can order it at drumarjohnson.com, or they can also get it in Louisville this Wednesday, Cincinnati this Thursday, Oakland, California, March the 6th. Okay. You got to order the book today. It's a must if you want to make a difference in your child's education. Black parent parents. Okay. Dr. Johnson, I want to thank you for uh, coming with us today. As well as Greg uh, Dunmore. This is 910 AM, the Superstation. My name is Robert Picano. I also want to thank uh, uh, Kevin, uh, our board director, as well as Tom Chaffee and Scotty Bowman and Police Commissioner Willie Burton. You're listening to 9 Cat. We'll be back with you next week from 8 to 10 AM. See, everything be all good when we be having fun. The difference is really needing a friend and having one. It's good when your people just. Here on Redline and Ben Cole Thompson. Go read my people. Crusader for Justice by George Damon Kidd, who died fighting for black people, did more for black people than Wendell Anthony will ever do in this nation. But here's what Damon Kidd said, Wendell Anthony. He's a bully, he's a thug, and he's a two-bit hustler who has used the presidency of the Detroit branch of the NAACP for his own financial and political gain. Wendell Anthony is kneeling before the mayor like a puppy, culturally emasculated leader of the NAACP. You're not trying to know status quo. We see through you. And you can only get it here on 910 AM Superstation. 
Shady Auto Sales, how can I help you? I need a car today, but I'm letting you know right now, my credit is not that good. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll need a blood sample, 20 credit references, wait two weeks, then you do the hokey pokey. And what? Pretty- that is ridiculous. I'm calling A&B Motors. You need to drive today. Call me first at 586-445-1600. 